The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Jason Hart. In 2001, a writer by the name of Seth Godin, a man who has shared many ideas and concepts with the marketing world, that seemed to be before their time. Now some in the field of marketing, they really like Seth. Some others really don't care much for him. In 2001, he released a book called Unleashing the Idea Virus. It was a success. It was an incredible success. Over five million copies were sold of unleashing the idea virus. As a matter of fact, you can't even say that it was sold because it was offered for free. Is the number one ebook of all time been translated into 10 different languages? I had the chance to be able to get my hands on a copy of that back in about 2004 or 2005, and I enjoyed reading every single page of it. One of the things that I liked about it is that it helps us to be able to understand some of the trends that we see in our nation uh, as well as the rest of the world. Not long after that was released, Seth then took some of the marketing strategies and the concepts and the ideas that he shared within that free work into a little book called Purple Cow. And it's in that book that Seth shared at the very introductory remarks that marketers generally have five P's of marketing. If they can line up all of these P's, then they have done what they are supposed to do. It's just sort of like a checklist, things that they need to make sure is within that product. Now, everybody has their different ideas of what piece should be involved. You know, the product, pricing, promotion, maybe publicity, permission, perhaps the packaging. But Seth said in that introduction, something disturbing has happened. The piece aren't working anymore. There's a new piece. Seth described how he and his family were traveling across the countryside. And as they were traveling, they began to notice the cows that were in the fields. Being from a larger town, it was quite intriguing. It was amazing to to look at cows. And as they passed through the pasture land, they kept looking at cows. And they'd come across more cows. And, And the more cows that they came across, the more they realized... There's cows everywhere. And then it wasn't as interesting anymore. Because that's all that they were seeing along the countryside were just a bunch of cows. And he continued with this quote. Cows, after you've seen them for a while, are boring. They may be perfect cows, attractive cows, cows with great personalities, cows lit by beautiful light, but they're still boring. A purple cow, though, Now that would be interesting. Seth said something disturbing has happened. The peas aren't working anymore. There's a new pea in town. It's the purple cow. A long time ago, before the age of advertising, Word was spread around by word of mouth. If a woman had a good product to sell at the market, then everybody talked about it and everybody went and bought that product. But then came the advertising years, especially with the invention of the television. And those with large factories, well, they could pay a certain amount of money and and have their product advertised in front of everybody. You put it on big billboards. 
But now he suggests that we're in a post-advertising age. People are too busy to pay attention anymore. So if you want to catch somebody's eye, if you want to do something that brings wealth in your direction, then you need a purple cow. You need something remarkable. Now, if we could think like marketers do, I would imagine that we could come up with a few P's of the Christian life. The way in which we would be able to influence people that are in the world. And, and these are the P's that have existed that we have trusted upon to be able to, to, to try to be influential in the world about us. Just think about these. You know, if you're polite unto others, if you are a regular participant in the church's activities, if, if you pray before your meals, if you are a polished individual, clean-shaven, your hair looks nice, you give the impression that you are living a different lifestyle than at least some people in the world. And even though you might be just might be polished, it's not overly expressive. You're, you're still just a, a plain, a simple person. You're passionate about the things about God, at least in comparison to, to somebody else. And, and you have this sort of positive attitude in your life. Those are all great peas. Are any one of these things wrong? Really, that's a bad question, isn't it? Now, every one of these that you see up on the screen that we just mentioned by mouth, all of these are biblically acceptable. So the question not to ask, is it wrong? The real question to ask, is this biblically effective? I know that it is biblically acceptable, but is it biblically effective? Something disturbing has happened. And I don't think any one of us are surprised by it. There was a long time ago, perhaps about a hundred years ago, that people were intrigued, they were influenced by Christians because of word of mouth, because of something that was special about those who were living the Christian life. And along the way, we became billboards of what the Christian life was supposed to be portraying, and so we portrayed the peas in a magnificent way. But something disturbing has happened. We realized that the peas don't work. There is another P that is effective. So the problem is that as individuals in the world look at what they perceive as Christianity, they see us lumped in with just anybody else that just happens to be a good person. It wears a smile on our face that dresses nicely, that doesn't use foul language and has a positive attitude about life. And as they drive through the, the routes and the paths of this life, they keep coming by exactly the same type of people. I use the word Christian here in a very generic sense. Christians, after you've seen them for a while, are boring. They may appear to be perfect Christians, attractive Christians, Christians with great personalities, Christians lit by beautiful light, but they're still boring. A purple cow, though. Now that would be interesting. What if we were all purple cows? You know, what, 
what if, what if we stood out away from the crowd? What if we were truly remarkable? You know, what if perhaps we actually could look at ourselves and see ourselves the way that God sees us? And I'm talking to you who are Christians. What if we could see ourselves the way that God sees us? Galatians 3.27 says that as many of you have been immersed into Christ, have put on Christ. What if we could see ourselves the way that God sees us? That when God looks upon us, He sees us through a blood-stained lens of grace. And He sees an extraordinary creature clothed in royal robes of Christ's righteousness. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul said, I want to be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul was saying, as I look at myself, I don't want to look upon myself with all the P's in all the right order, the righteousness that I can accomplish, the good deeds that I can accomplish, but rather I want to look at myself as God sees me. I want to see, I want him to see me, and I want to see myself the way God sees me. And that is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, Isaiah describes that our righteous deeds, they are like filthy garments, filthy rags. And he rejoices. You read back, read back in chapter 61 and verse 10, he rejoices. He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. See, we as Christians are remarkable because that's the way that God looks upon us. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. For good works. It wasn't by good works. It's not from good works. He created us for good works. That we should walk in them. And He has prepared those works for us to walk in since the very beginning of time. He prepared them beforehand. So the question that we want to ask, not just today but over the next two weeks, is how do we milk the most out of the most remarkable life that God has gifted us? What is our motivation? Now, where is the rationale for how we should be living? Where is the desire? Now, we look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, and we find a wonderful passage about being a good example to the world. And I wonder maybe if we have not looked at that passage so often that we sort of overlook some of the import of that message. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's obvious that we recognize that there is a personal responsibility upon ourselves to be a good example unto others. But do we ever ask, where did that light come from? I didn't make it. I didn't fashion it. I didn't create it to myself. This light that I am supposed to be expressing, this light that I'm supposed to be getting out of there, this purple cow that I'm supposed to be. Where did that come from? Well, now John tells us in John chapter 1 that Jesus was the life of men and, and He became the light. Then later in John chapter 12, whenever, whenever Jesus was closing up His public ministry... They were asking him, well, who is the son? He told them, said, the light is among you for just a little bit longer.
while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. In 1 John chapter 1, we're told God is light. We're, we're told to walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from all sins. That light was given to us by God. So how do we express that light? How do we become remarkable, not just with who we are, but what we do out of response of what we have become? And over the next three weeks, today and the next two weeks, we're going to milk a cow for all it's worth. I can, because of grace, I ought because of creation, and I will because of love. Today I want us to take a look at the first one, I can because of grace. To begin with, Jesus makes it possible. Let's turn our Bibles over to Romans chapter 7. At the close of Romans chapter 7, Paul describes a, an incredible struggle of being a remarkable creature of God's creation. Because he's still living in the body of the flesh. You back up to verse 15 and he says, I do not understand my own actions. And then he follows up verse 20. Even if I do right, evil is close at hand. Have you ever had those days where you reflect upon your life and the things that you did and the things that you did wrong? Why in the world did I do that? Paul has such a, a, an insatiable urge to do what is right that it is really bothering him deep down inside. He wants to do what is right. He longs to be able to do what is right. And all he wants to do is to be able to be in, in God's good graces. You know, he wants God to be smiling down upon him. and He, know, he, he knows he has that. But still he struggles with it. I don't know why I do the things that I don't want to do. The thing, very things that I hate. I don't understand that. Do you ever question that yourself? Why you do the things that you're not supposed to do and you don't do the things that you're supposed to do? That's what Paul was talking about. And then in verse 24 he cries out, O wretched man that I am. Though his heart deeply desires to want to do what is right, he still struggles with being pulled in the wrong direction because he's still living in the flesh. Who will deliver me from this wretched body? He's looking forward now. He's, he's longing to, to look forward into the future whenever he would no longer have this body when he will not just be 100% forgiven, but in the resurrection in the last day would be given a body where he would be completely 100% holy and sanctified. That's what he was longing for, and that was the end that he was looking for. When you look in Philippians chapter 3, on to verses 13 and 14, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I haven't attained it yet, but I'm, I'm trying. But then as you move forward, in verse 25, in one short statement, he deeply reflects upon the basis of God's grace that makes living a remarkable life possible. He says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Following that up in chapter 8 in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Stop right there. Did you catch that last? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be... What is righteousness? 
Righteousness is satisfying the law's requirements. That's what righteousness is. And Jesus satisfied the law's requirements, the law's penalty, by dying upon the cross. He satisfied the law. He took the penalty that is held against us and placed it on His account. We were ransomed. We were redeemed. We were purchased by His blood. That's how God is able to look upon us with that blood-stained lens of grace. Because of what Jesus did. Now, this describes the basis of God's grace, how we become remarkable. But, but where is the power? Where is the power in which we can live this life? I want us to read further now. Looking into verse 4, Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I want you to notice something from here down to verse 11. He's not making a contrast here between God's Spirit and bad deeds or sinful living. He's making a contrast between the Spirit of God and our own puny weakness, the flesh. Even in our strongest days, It's being contrasted to the Spirit of God. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. Egocentrism. But those who live according to the Spirit, they're theocentric in life, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, but it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's stop there for a second. So where does the power come from? It comes from the Spirit. We can be assured that God has not left us to ourselves. We can be assured that God has not left us to our own abilities, our own talents, our own intelligence, because it's far too weak. You have not been left to fend for yourself. I mentioned last week that within God's grace you find a double cure. You see, there's a double curse. There is a debt problem, D-E-B-T, and there is a death problem. To the debt problem, we have justification. Forgiveness of our sins, remission of our sins. But to the death problem, the health problem. There is something else that God provides. He wants us to understand there's more than just the forgiveness of sins that God gives us. There's more within His grace than just to say, okay, the penalty against the law has already been paid because He wants to gift us another gift of His grace. And that is regeneration. It's the other side of grace. You know, it's that one that sometimes we kind of ignore, other times we just sort of lump it together with justification. No, we do that quite a bit. I, I've done it for years. So, oh, well, remission of sins and forgiveness of sins and being raised to walk up in newness of life and being born again and coming into His kingdom and being sanctified. It's all the same thing, saved. Yes, it all fits under the umbrella, I guess you could say, of His grace. 
They all have a distinct meaning. They all have a dis- this distinct place and meaning for our lives. And this other side of grace is the word regeneration. It's found in Titus chapter 3. I want you to read with me in verses 3 through 8. And again, we notice a contrast here. We actually notice two contrasts. One contrast is between the sinful life that we had before and the mercy of God. The other contrast are our works of righteousness compared to the salvation of God. Let's begin reading in verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The word regeneration simply means birthed again. That's all it means to be birthed again. Jesus used the same terminology in John chapter 3 and verses 5 through 7 when He had told Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit. So that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born again. This is what Peter described in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 when he describes us being begotten again by the mercies of God. It is the new life described in Romans chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6. It is that spiritual circumcision in Colossians chapter 2. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, the the passage, and I think we can look at this as a prophecy, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It was a circumcision that was not made of hands. But now we're talking about a new creation. So now instead of seeing God as a judge that deals with us in accordance to law, now we see Him in a different light. He puts on a different robe. Instead of the robe of a judge, he now puts on the coat of the great physician. As Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 describes, as a physician, he goes into our hearts at the occasion of our salvation. When we were immersed in him, to remove a heart of stone and place within us a heart of flesh. He said, I put my spirit in you so that you will walk according to my statutes. It is a new life that has been given. We're no longer sick in sin, but now new life has been given. We've been raised up to walk in newness of life. If we're in Christ, we are a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new. When this occurs, we become 100% ready for holy living. Now, we still have a question. We understand. We understand that grace in Jesus and His death on the cross is the basis of who we are and how remarkable we are. And we understand now that this remarkable creation of God, we have God's indwelling Spirit within us, which has brought life upon us. And all of this is wonderful news, but we're still wondering, what now? And God still gives us more. He gives us power. 
When we're regenerated, it's not as if the Holy Spirit comes into our life and, and touches us with a magic wand and then just flitters off, goes somewhere else. He comes in and He takes up residence within us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, 19 reminds us that we are the temple of God's Holy Spirit. When you look into Romans chapter 8 and verses 9 through 11, three times He describes how the Holy Spirit indwells within us. Take a look at it, verses 8 through 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who indwells within you. What results out of the regeneration is an initial sanctification where we are set apart from the world. Because we have been justified and because we have new life within us, our new place is among those who are sanctified by faith in Him. Acts chapter 26 and verse 18. We're no longer out of the kingdom, in the kingdom of darkness, but now we have been transferred into the power or into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. And it's not just the setting apart, but as the Holy Spirit indwells within us, He operates to aid us in living a sanctified life, what we would call a progressive sanctification to help us to grow in maturity, to strive to be holy as God is holy. That's the purpose of regeneration, to make us ready for holy living. Still the question is, why is He doing, what is He doing in sanctification? He is empowering us. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16 says that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. What kind of power is this? It's not miraculous. It's not a ministerial gift. Those are spiritual gifts. They are not to be confused with the indwelling, saving, redeeming gift of God's Holy Spirit. Instead, it is a moral power to resist temptation, to defeat the devil, to obey God's will, and to be faithful any, even under the most difficult circumstances. You know, in ways that we cannot explain the Holy Spirit emboldens us. It, he encourages us and He reinforces our weak will so that we can put to death the deeds of the body. You look into Romans chapter 8 and verses 12 and 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, then we shall live. And because we have that strength, because we now have that courage, because we have faith, you believe that God exists? Do you believe in His ability to answer prayers? Do you believe in His ability to be active in your life? Then we can also take the Bible's word for it. That He has gifted us with this most incredible, most special gift. That is, we are working out our salvation, and that has nothing to do with what comes before the occasion of our salvation and immersion. It has to do with our Christian living. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but we don't need to forget verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you. 
not on the outside by some external force, and then not as if it were a turning in the stomach or some aura around your head, like a little halo. It is God who is at work in you both to will and to work His good pleasure. And so it is because of the basis of grace in Jesus Christ and the regeneration that occurred whenever we were immersed and the now continual presence of His life within us, giving us life, we can truly say that I can. I can because of grace. Now, will we choose to be a boring cow? Or would we have faith and trust in God that we could indeed be something, someone remarkable? Can you imagine, can you imagine what life would have been like for Clark Kent had he never thought that he was Superman? I mean, can you just imagine the picture of Clark Kent lying on his deathbed and then looking down and muttering, what's this, what's this S on my chest? Superman? What's that? And this entire time, he could have been speeding past bullets. He could have been leaping over tall buildings. He could have been saving lives. How sad would it be for any one of us to go to our deathbed and figuratively to look down and say, H.S., what's that? And finally coming to the realization that we could have lived with a greater confidence a greater strength. And this life not leaning upon our own abilities and our own puny weaknesses, but truly living a life where we say, I can because of grace. This morning we offer the invitation of our Lord to give you the opportunity to come into that grace to find that double cure for the double curse upon your life. The occasion that we speak of is immersion into Jesus Christ, where you would be forgiven of the, the trespasses of sin and that you would be healed and raised into a new life. There's also an opportunity for us to pray. I want us all to be able to think of ourselves as being remarkable beings. And not just to think it, but to actually believe it. And to trust in the strength of our God. So perhaps we need to pray for one another. And it could be that you've been looking for that source of, of strength, and we want to help you to be able to harness it and to access it. We want to pray for you. If there's any way that we can help you this morning, please come while we stand and sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart words of life. Words of hope, give us strength, help us cope in this world where we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing. We have come with open hearts, oh,
that the ancient words impart holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart